Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I invite you to join me as we explore what it looks like to choose joy in the messy middle while embracing the inspiration, intention, and action that you can take to find joy in your every day. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 270 here on Jumpstart Your Joy. This week on the show, I'm really excited to be joined by Molly McGlynn Noterer. And we're talking all about how she and a friend started their very own business in the elder care services field and how she recently published a chapter in her very first book, Awakening and Deepening to Truth. Molly and I went to high school together and recently reconnected and it was such a treat to catch up with her. I know you're going to find this to be so inspiring because Molly is talking all about how she has recently stepped into her own truth and owning who she is and the fullness of her story after feeling a lot of shame about her past and things that had happened even back into childhood. And I really want to thank Molly for coming on and sharing her story with us as well. Before we get to the show, I want to give you all a very warm welcome and say thank you so much for tuning in and for making Jumpstart Your Joy part of your week. If you're new, also a very warm welcome. I'm so glad you found the show. Jumpstart Your Joy has been on the air for six years now. And if you want to find out more about it and look back at the 269 past episodes, you can find all the information you need over at the website, which is jumpstartyourjoy.com. And you'll be able to find show notes of how you can connect with Molly or find her book. And and those will be accessible at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash episode 270. While you're over there, please be sure and sign up for the newsletter where I talk all about the inspiration, intention, and action and send out three joyful things that you can try every Thursday. So please be sure and sign up for that. And you'll also be on the list to find out more about what's going on with the show. Of course, the theme for this season is all about finding joy in the messy middle. And Molly really has so many amazing things to say about this both from the perspective of having worked with seniors in her elder care services role. She says a lot about how she's connected with the older generation and how they have so much to share about the things that they've been through in their lives and how that can give us inspiration for what we're facing right now in the year 2020. And I also really love that Molly is vulnerable and shares about her own journey of writing her story through her book, awakening and deepening to truth and how she talks about what happens when you start to talk about the things that are hard for you and how it brings out more joy and more conversation and more community. And so I really applaud her for stepping into that. I know it can be difficult and I also know that it is a path to finding your own way and finding your own message and bringing more joy into the world once we look at and accept and sometimes embrace what our past has meant to us. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Welcome to the show, Molly. Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. This week on the show, I am so excited to have Molly McLean Noterer on. Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, Molly. Hello, Paula. So good to see you. <laughs> and we're just laughing because we just uh, kind of caught up after a 30-year <laughs> hiatus of knowing each other and uh it's really been a treat to yeah just a couple days or 30 years and it's been a real treat to get to be able to catch back up with you vice versa it's been a blast yeah so I'm really excited to have Molly on because she is both a published author and she has started her own business in the elder care services area called legacy concierge services and I wanted to talk to her about both things. You're a multi-passionate, clearly, where you have all these things that you love to do. So first question I ask everybody is, tell us a little bit about what were your earliest sparks of joy? What did you find the most joy in as a child? You know, that's such a cool question because working with seniors, I think about those things a lot. And I think going back, we both grew up in the same town. And and I think a lot about the innocence of being a kid where I didn't realize how innocent I was growing up. And I mean, I, things that made me happy that I have memories of, or I have two younger sisters and being able to spend time with them in our backyard, we had a pool growing up and we would spend hours and hours in the summertime in the pool, playing all kinds of funny, silly made up games and just the innocence of that time together. And that's something so special. And I see my youngest sister has three little boys 
and I just see that those three boys are playing together like my sisters and I used to. And I just, it brings back that nostalgia of the happiness. I love seeing that. I think that is a big thing. And honestly, you know, you and I played softball together and I, I have great fun memories of being part of a team and I played sports all through high school. I was not a great athlete by admission, but I love being part of a team. And now I turn that into, I love being part of a community. But I think those are the the big things. I I've always felt like I had some really wonderful friends and I just think we were innocently living our life and just going along. We didn't know about the big world in front of us. We just lived in our small little bubble and it was pretty nice. <laughs> so the big thing I think is just my remembering my sisters and like Christmas morning or Christmas Eve, we would always sleep in the same room together and wake each other up. And I mean, I'm talking when I was eight, nine, 10 years old and my youngest sister is six years younger than me. And so we always wanted to maintain that excitement for her for as long as we could. And just kind of going through that and giggling and laughing and get, getting the giggles with my mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that you brought up softball because I still every spring, like I remember being out on the field, like at dusk and being like, oh, it's softball time. Like there's a serious joy about softball for me. So much, so much fun. I have so many great memories. And again, I know I wasn't the best athlete. I wasn't the best player, but I love being part of the team and, you know, playing together and working hard together and winning together. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but in high school, I did play basketball in the whole country. We were the most losing basketball team in the whole country. I don't remember what the number was, but finally in my senior year, we won our first game. And it was such a big deal that we were on the local NBC station and on ESPN (laughs) because we broke the streak. And I remember that because I remember I didn't care. We had so much fun being together as a team and I can lose. It's okay. You have to get back up and start over again. And it taught me a lot, but I I just have just so much fun remembering the camaraderie of being part of that team. We were friends and, you know, we all still showed up. There's probably a lot of lessons in the, how do we show up and be present for each other and still have fun doing something because it's not about winning at that point. It would be amazing if, if it happened clearly, but (laughs) that's not the thing that's keeping the team together. No, I mean, we were, we did have a lot of fun and we worked hard and we did try our best. We just weren't as good as everybody else. I think those are the things that I think about that brings me joy and, and even translating into today's life, like being part of a community, being part of a team. Those are the things that bring me joy and, and you know, having camaraderie with people and helping each other and just that still translate, but it's maybe not as innocent as it used to be 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And there always are through lines, obviously, of what somebody loves as a child and then what they're doing now. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you became interested in elder care services and maybe the journey to starting your own company. Well, well, it's an interesting one. It wasn't expected. I'll be honest with you. I, I went to school at UC Davis and went to junior college first. And when I transferred into UC Davis, I was pretty clear that I wanted to be a second grade school teacher. And I was very focused on that. And I studied human development and in human development, we had a child, there was a daycare program on campus at Davis. And that was also considered to be our lab. So the students who were going to go into education would go and do a lot, some lab work there and observe and stuff. And I remember the first day at the lab at the preschool and the kids, how they get the shrieking, yelling and screaming, you know, the high, really high pitched excitement. I had my first panic attack at that point because I couldn't handle that volume. And I realized at that point that I love kids, but it wasn't my space. And so I had to kind of reevaluate. And at the time I realized I didn't have good grades at Davis, but I was doing really well and really enjoyed my aging classes, all the classes about gerontology which was weird because I obviously had grandparents, but I didn't really know my grandparents. So I didn't have any kind of mentors or people to look up to in that kind of grandparent generation. And, but I decided that's what I wanted to do. So I'm going to switch gears and go work with seniors. And I announced that to my family one night, I think it was at a St. Patrick's Day. So my whole extended family was together. And my, I said, I'm going to work with seniors. I've decided I've changed my mind. And my aunt, who was a social worker at a program in Petaluma, 
said to me, you're nuts. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. You're out of your mind. And I'm like, no, this is what I want to do. I, I'm doing well in those classes. And she said, okay, then I want you to do an internship with me at this day program where I'm a social worker at. So I did. So for two years, I would drive from Davis to Petaluma at this adult day program. And that experience was probably the most powerful experience to this day. I, the people who were in that, the participants in that program, many of them had dementia or um, stroke-related dementia in that program. And I was so just fascinated and intrigued and in love with the authenticity of each person in each day knowing that we might have an amazing moment right now, but the next time I come next week, they may not remember me. So it was my responsibility to create a safe environment for them so they could be themselves and not have fear of judgment of not remembering things or maybe not being able to say their words. The word is in their mind, but they can't say it out loud. And, and so I learned so much from that experience. And to this day, I hold that as one of the most influential experiences I ever had. And one of the ladies in the program, Marie, she was from born in Yugoslavia. And she gave me a frame that she brought when she immigrated to the United States. When I graduated from Davis, I was still doing my internship. She gave me that for my graduation gift. And I have that right above my light switch in my office. Mm. So every day I see that and it's what grounds me to remember. This is why I do what I do. And this is who influenced me to do what I do. When I graduated from Davis, I started working on an adult day program in Sacramento and just flourished from there. I, I was an activity director for two years and just loved every single minute of it because you get to learn so much. Yeah, You're dealing with the history of people. And I mean, I met someone who was a hundred years old. This was back in like 95. And she came to California from Tennessee in a covered wagon. Wow. And she was able to tell me the story. And you know, those are the things you don't get to read in the history books. I met a man who was in an apartment by himself. He was going to come into this day program. I was evaluating to see if it was appropriate. And I said, tell me about you. Tell me your history. And he said, he pointed over at a, a trunk in his apartment. It was a teeny tiny apartment. And he goes, well, my whole life is in that trunk. And I said, tell me what's in there. And he was a, a black gentleman who was arrested in the late 50s, early 60s, and he was put in jail for an amount of time. He was accused of raping a white woman, and he didn't. He was innocent. He was released, but he, he turned his life into advocacy, and he became a preacher, and he preached with and marched with Martin Luther King, and so like, I'm getting goosebumps telling Me you too. this story. So to be able to have the honor to hear that story and to hear it from him directly and the emotions and the experience and some of the shame he had and the pride he had. And that's the gift that you get to not only help people, but then you get to learn about the treasure of their life. And that's a huge motivator for me every day. There's a person that gets to tell you their story. And most people want to tell you a story like I'm doing to you right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah I was thinking, yeah, I can totally relate to this. It's so right. It's so fascinating to hear the inner workings and also understand the hardships or the, the life events that people overcome to be where they are in the moment. That's a really powerful story about that gentleman. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still remember his name. I won't say it because he's long passed away, but I, still, I won't say it because of confidentiality. But I mean, those are the things you, you learn perspective. I remember when 9-11 happened. That was the first real traumatic experience on a global level that I had been in. And I was just remember being overwhelmed and I, at the time I was working in Sacramento and I had an assisted living community and it happened. And I remember going in and saying, I'm going to go hang out with my residents and see what's going on. Like, what are they thinking about it? Their perspective was like, this is a horrible thing, but we will get through it because this is who we are. We as a nation will, you know, it was like, so they had, cause they had lived through World War II. They had lived through so many traumatic things in their life and to get those perspectives of Yes, we have to acknowledge what we're dealing with in the moment, but we also have to have the hope and knowing and the confidence that we can get through this and become better as a result of it. And so you hear those things, and you're, it's really empowering. Like I'm supposed to help them and they're helping me. Yeah, that is amazing. And I love the perspective there because here in season six, one of the things that I'm wanting to dive into in a bigger way is how do we find joy or meaning in what many people would call the messy middle, meaning like, we're in the middle of it right now and it's messy. <laughs> so like, yes. <laughs> how do we find meaning in that? And I love what you've just said about 
there's connection in other generations who have seen other things, but also that the human spirit and our individual spirits are that of, you know, we're going to get through it because that's who we are. Yeah. That's who we are as a culture. And for them to share that and say, it gives you that hope of, you feel so overwhelmed and helpless in those moments. And sometimes in this moment right now too, you, you feel that level of helplessness, but you, then you talk to someone who has life experience and they're willing to share it and you go, this too shall pass, right? That's the saying. So this will pass. And that's, it's pretty powerful. It is. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. And let's dive in with your role in becoming an author, because I love the story that I heard you discuss with Doris Birch and that really similarly to the way you described finding your life's work, like you found your way into becoming an author. You, would you tell us about that story? Again, by accident. So I, I'm part of a national organization called Polka Dot Powerhouse, and I met Doris through Polka Dot. She is a, an incredible influencer, coach. She's a very powerful presence, and she stood up at this meeting that I was at and introduced herself, and I was instantly drawn to her. And I, she actually sat down near us, and I went over and sought her out and just told her, I don't know you, or I don't know anything about you, but I have to meet you because there's something about you that is just, I'm drawn to you. And so we started conversations and you know, we started connecting and talking and she was asking me about my story and she was sharing her story. And she said, I want you to tell your story. And it started off with when I was going to school at UC Davis, I learned I had a learning disability. And so we started that process. And as we were, as writing, she wanted me to share that. And as she kept pushing me and saying more, I know that there's more you're hiding right now. You are hiding. I want more from you. And you don't say no to Doris. And I mean that in the best compliment. Um, you yeah. do not say no to her because she has this intuitive way of being able to see beyond what's in front of you. So that's where it started. I started diving into first the learning about the learning disabilities and then even going back further about the insecurities of you know, knowing that I had certain struggles that maybe no one else knew about and those insecurities that come up with it. And that, so that kind of was a past, but then at the time moving to the present, I also had a lot of problems when I talk about it in my chapter, my husband and I, we really wanted to have kids and I, we just were not successful. We couldn't figure out what was going on. And I ended up having some serious issues with fibroids and possible ovarian cancer and went through this three-year journey of just hell, basically. And so those insecurities came out. You know, I'm a woman. I'm supposed to have kids. Why? Everyone asks me, why don't you have kids? And it, I tell you, I always kind of had it as a secret. Some of my, my closest friends and, of course, my family knew that part of the journey. But now there's a freedom of being able to share both sides of the story because I don't have to hide it anymore. And, and it's amazing the discussions you can have around. When, when you make yourself vulnerable, you learn a lot about other people and there really creates these amazing conversations and trust building and community building. And it's not easy to this day still. <laughs> I still cringe sometimes a little bit when, when, when someone asks me, why don't you guys have kids or what happened to this or what? But I realized that by writing this chapter, it allowed me to have the freedom to be honest and be open because I'm not the only person. My husband and I are not the only people who have gone through what we've gone through. What I realized, especially after the book came out, I had a lot of people send me letters and emails and it was pretty powerful and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And, but I realized that the more that we talk about these things, the less shame that there is, because you do have a, you know, a hat of shame that, you know, and you try to hide it and cover it. And, but when you do share things like this, that shame starts to go away, not only for yourself, but for other people. And you allow that for people to start feeling more comfortable with what their journey is too. It's still overwhelming to me that I wrote that. <laughs> it's really overwhelming to me that I shared all that, but it was a major risk. And I have to say, going back to Doris, I took the risk because I trusted her and I took the risk because she trusted me too. And so that was something that was pretty powerful in itself. So, yeah, thank you. And there's so much in there because I, I think the truth of it, especially when you say yes to something and like digging into it about even things in your own, for me in my own past, that even the show came out of that place of wanting to really be vulnerable, but also wanting to open up a safe space for people to share their own story so that we all can see that there's these places that people struggle while they are all different, but that if we can maybe share it and show somebody else that there's hope, that's the thing that makes the difference. And, and for me, it was being diagnosed with PTSD after a very long 
childbirth situation (laughs) and having a lot of trauma around that. But seeing when I fought through that and got real with it and then had a therapist say, someday, you she's not now, but someday you're going to want to share because your strength in this, and, and I see that in you too, like your strength in getting through this is in, like really inspiring for other people. What you just shared, I mean, you, and with your show and how you, you create a space, you start with a level of compassion because you know, and like with what you're doing, your compassion translates into, I'm going to share and be vulnerable. So you can too. And the compassion creates that trust. That's just so you know. So yeah, that's coming from you. That comes from you. Thank you. Yeah. Cause it's never about going in just for the sake of going into a topic. It's always in service of a greater good because we've all had a messy moment or a really hard thing. And we're like, oh no, I, this isn't going to be the thing. This isn't what defines me. Like I'm getting beyond this. And that's the thing that will ultimately define me. Exactly. And you have to keep doing it. It's going to keep evolving. It's going to keep changing. And I mean, you hope, right? That's the hope of everything keeps to keeps evolving. So that's the goal. <laughs> yes, so true. Mm, that's so good. I know in a, a previous interview, I heard you talk with Doris Birch, how you woke up and found the internal yes of uh, sharing your story and like being the authentic person in an outward way. Do you want to talk about what that internal yes is and, and how you woke up to it? Gosh, I, and even since I wrote it, it's probably changed and evolved. (laughs) So for so long, I was told, no, I wasn't worth it. I wasn't worthy of, and I bought into it and believed that going on. This is going back from, you know, being a little kid. I, I remember being told you're not worthy. No, having dreams, being told, no, you can't do it. You're not capable And I still have those insecurities and I still have that internal dialogue. And even sometimes today that ghost comes back. But I was just told, no, you can't. No, you no, you can't. You're not worth it. If I did something that I thought was really good or positive, no, you can't share that. You can't brag. You can't boast. You can't. And it was never bragging. It was more like celebrating. And but I learned it to become bragging, which was shameful. And so anyhow, so I think over time and learning to have confidence. But surrounding myself with people who allowed me to just be myself without having shame, that is where the yes came from. Because I needed to be around people who were authentically supporting the yes. And I needed to hear it enough that I started to believe it. And then once I started to believe it, that became my internal yes. And I will tell you, I'm a big believer in therapy and I have gone to my share of therapy and I haven't gone for a couple, you know, a year now, but I probably will go back at some point again, because I have something I believe in because when I do go through my ups and downs and I do struggle sometimes. And sometimes the internal dialogue becomes really destructive rather than constructive. And that's something I have to always be mindful of and keep track of, but it's about surrounding yourself with people who are going to support and celebrate the true person rather than put the expectations of who I should be. And I think you and I both have a similar path in the sense that we grew up in the same area. (laughs) There are expectations to be somebody that you can't be, or you're not, and you, or you don't want to be. And, and so I just, there was a lot of no's, there was a lot of no's and a lot of shame. And, but I think as I grow up and now that I'm almost a year and a half till I'm 50, it's, you know, I've surrounded myself with really good people and it's taken me that time to do that. And then it's taken that time for me to believe them. So that was the other thing. And then once I believed them, I started believing in myself. And so it's a lot of, it started externally and then worked into the internal and therapy, definitely therapy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've had my, my fair share of coaching and therapy and yes. And it is interesting because I think so many of us listen to the shoulds for so long and, and and it is always interesting to take stock in where the shoulds got established. I think some of it's just wherever you grew up and not necessarily even your family, but like sometimes it's even a silent should of, I mean, in our case, I know one of the big ones in the school that we went to was we dress this way. I mean, it's, it's you know, like we wear pink on Wednesdays or whatever that is. <laughs> And I still don't follow the guidelines. No, I don't. I clearly don't either. Yeah. It's such a strange 
programming of things. And then we get into this place where we don't trust our own self and our own judgment, even the clothes that we wear, which is so ridiculous. So thank you for sharing about how you found your way back to the true internal yes, and which is a, a guidepost for wherever you're going. Exactly. And you have, and then being able to have the confidence, I think going back to losing a lot in basketball, I know that there's going to be failures sometime, but I have to have the confidence that I try. And if, as long as I try with a hundred percent of what in the moment, that in the moment of what I can do, as long as I'm making that effort, then that's the yes. Let's talk a little bit about your company. It's called Legacy Concierge Services. Do you want to tell us about the business and, and the, what you do? And I don't know, any nuggets about having a business that you're running and that you started with other people? Yeah. And it's two people who are running it now. So we've had transition in the very beginning as well. I have a wonderful, amazing business partner. Her name is Deanna. And we started about four and a half years ago at this point. And we both had worked in senior living, senior care for myself. At that point, it was about 25 years for myself and for Deanna, it was about 10 years. We worked in a skilled nursing together and realized the investors, the corporate world was overtaking the quality of care and service for the people that we serve, those, the seniors. So we were feeling very disillusioned. I'll be completely honest. I got so frustrated with the focus on profit over people. I spoke up. The company didn't like that I did that. <laughs> I got in trouble. And, you know, I, I no longer had a job with that company soon after, which was the greatest gift. And at that point, Deanna was still working there and we felt like we could do something better. We felt like we could do, do senior care better. We felt we could do it with integrity. We felt we could do it with a focus of dignity for the people that we serve. And so we started Legacy Concierge Services and we use the term legacy because it really comes with the idea of what we do is care coordination and senior living placement. So we will help families who are navigating the, the aging process with themselves or with a loved one. We really truly listen in, kind of peel back the onion. And then based on what we learn and what we share, we will coordinate the services for the family so they don't have to, whether it's a, you know, in-home care or a dog walker, or a chef, a contractor to help retrofit the house so it's wheelchair safe or walker safe or whatever it may be where we do that. And then on the other side, we do when someone's no longer able to safely be at home or maybe spending too much money to stay at home, we will help them relocate into a, a assisted living or Alzheimer's type community. So we'll walk them through that whole process. And so legacy came out the term because I personally was one of the primary caregivers for my mother-in-law who lived in, up in Nevada City, about three and a half hours away from us. And when we would go and visit her, which was often, we realized that we were so focused on the tasks that we had to do while we were there to visit her. And she was very stubborn and not willing to accept a lot of help and wasn't always necessarily the nicest person about it either. <laughs> so during that time, we the resentment built and we would get there, we'd focus on the task, get our meals made, clean the outside. She lived on 20 acres of property, clean out, you know, all these tasks. And we lost the relationship with her. So that's where the, the term, the legacy comes is that we want to take on those tasks for the family so that they can focus on the legacy of their relationship. So, you know, as things transition in life as they do, at the end of the day, we want the family to be able to say, I'm so glad we had that time with mom or dad or whoever the person is who needs the care, because they were able to actually spend time and connect and learn. And we kind of help to model that. We have the conversations with the seniors themselves, which are the best. And we ask a lot of questions. And a lot of times the adult children will be like, I didn't know that about my mom. I can't believe my mom shared that with you. And it's like, well, I ask the question. I have no preconceived notion. I asked the question and they answered because I have a curiosity. And sometimes families lose that curiosity of each other as, you know, as time go or as caregiving becomes more intense and more needed. And so that's where that, where that whole thing came up. And so, yeah, we're four and a half years into it now. And being an entrepreneur is like going through a tunnel full of water without scuba gear sometimes, but it's also the best thing in the world. And we're constantly learning how to be better, do better. We just say, let's go for it. We don't have anyone telling us how or what to do. We kind of are paving our own path. And we have mentors that we've reached out to. And one of the first things that we did 
when we did launch Legacy is that we found ourselves, you know, really seeking women, especially women entrepreneurs. So we joined as a local group here in, in the North Bay called Marin Women at Work. That was one of the first groups that we joined and committed to. And we were surrounded by women entrepreneurs and who were there to help each other and they guided us. If we had questions, they took us under their wing because we, we had the deer eyed, what the hell are we doing look? And we were trying and they knew it. So they wanted to help us. And, you know, ultimately our goal is to be able to give back to when we see someone who wants to, is ready to start a business. My hope is that someday we'll be able to give that same mentorship that we received. So that was really a powerful thing. And we're still learning. We trip and fall and what is the saying, you know, we fall forward. And so we're still making that happen, but I'm very fortunate too, because Deanna is my business partner. She's also one of my best friends and she is an incredible, we compliment each other. You know, she is a go getter, dive in and make it happen. I'm the big picture, creative, you know, drive her crazy because I come up with different ideas all the time. And and she has the ability to hear that and get, take that information and make things happen. And she makes, she gets things done. And it's just so awesome to be able to have that type of a partnership where we really are a yin and a yang, but we love what we do. And we know our, what our focus is, is dignity and integrity in our service and for the people that we serve. And we do not lose sight of that. That's, that is our value and our ethics. And we, we hold true to that every single day. I love that. But there's the core values that pull you together closer. And if something comes up, you're like, well, what, what would dignity and integrity do right now? <laughs> And we, we've had those hard conversations with each other, not, not questioning each other's, you know, motive or anything, but just in terms of a general situation we might be dealing with. And we'll talk about like, what's the integrity or where's the dignity in, in the situation for the person that we're serving? And how do we, maybe a family is not providing dignity to their loved one for whatever reason. And so, you know, how do we approach that family and bring dignity back into the situation and but sure. do it with respect of, you know, we don't know what the dysfunction of the family is, but we, you know, we have to be respectful of that, but we also have to have those hard conversations of look right now in this moment, this is what we need to focus on. And that's the quality of life of your loved one. And this is what's going to be required of that from you and from us to ensure that that happens. And so we'll have those conversations and she and I will be a good checks and balance in that process. And we come from a place of what's best for the person that we're serving. That's, that's it. That's all. We don't have investors. We both say our husbands are our investors. There's no one standing over us telling us yeah. how or what we should do. And, you know, it's what's right for the person and what's right for the family. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Well, and I get a sense because I think you and I are also very similarly minded and kind of rebellious maybe in spirit. I mean, just to rewind a little bit back to where you were talking about when you were working in a nine to five in a corporation. I also have been the person that's like, but wait, wait, you know, maybe it's not about like, this sounds like it's all for profit. Sometimes it was that discussion, but like really calling people out on like, why, wait, why are we doing it this way? Because it doesn't make sense. And then everyone's like, oh, what's she doing? <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think there's something really beautiful about that when you then go to be an entrepreneur, because then you, you've already seen the things that you know you don't like or that feel wrong or whatever, but you're also not afraid to question how you set up your business or like you kind of have that I don't know, something about it, like a, a, a hunger for something very different than what you've seen. Yeah. I mean, we're constantly trying to evolve, like, again, the word evolve, we're, we're constantly trying to evolve ourselves. And, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure looking back, I was a pain in the, you know, what for these companies, because I would get so frustrated and so agitated. And it was like, we can do this better. Stop following the status quo. We're dealing with human beings and humans are so dynamic. So we have to be dynamic in our service. And so that's kind of like where we're always looking at. So we're always looking at like, how can we take the next step? Even four and a half years ago, who our seniors were and our elders were four and a half years ago in their families to who they are now. We're going into another generation of elders and we're also going into another generation of their family. And so it's like, even though it's only four and a half years, but things are changing. You know, we have elders who are internet savvy and their tools and their access is so much more readily available. And so we have to constantly change and we have to push the envelope. And there is a status quo in senior care and it's very stale. And to me, it's very antiquated. It's because it's the way they've always done it. 
And we just don't believe in that. That's just not our thought process. It's like we started out as a company four and a half years ago. I literally remember the first meeting that we had to try to tell someone about our services. We met with Alzheimer's Association up here in, in the North Bay. And we were good friends with them. I've volunteered with them for many years, as has Deanna. So we're like, well, we'll go tell them about our services. Well, when we sat down, we didn't know what we were saying. We didn't know how to describe our business. We didn't really know how to define our pricing. None of it. We just like, this is what we want to do. Well, you know, now here we are four and a half years later, we, we have a better a sense of who we are and what we're doing. And you asked the question, I'm able to, to answer the question with, you know, somewhat articulately, but you ask me in a year from now, and I might tell you something completely different because our base is still there, the integrity and the dignity, but our service may evolve because the people that we serve are evolving. We have to stay on our toes. Don't, I can't stand when I hear some of the things, well, that's just the way we do it. That's just how we do it. That to me is like a curse word. That's just how we do it. Like, no, it's not, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It kind of makes me go a little crazy when I hear that, especially process wise, at least for me, when some things like people are independently maybe doing data entry in two different places, for example, you're like, what's going on here? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what my, my least favorite term right now, I I heard it recently on a, a different level, but is it is what it is. I literally hear that term and I go into a crazy person because it's not no, it's not. It is what it is. No, on any level for anything. No. And why is anyone going to accept that as an answer? Exactly. So that's how we kind of take our, what we're doing is that who we are today and how we evolve, we will evolve. And because we have to, we have to change to the people we serve, not to what our needs are, but to what their needs are. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's really, really good. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective too. Yeah. And I would love to have another you know, another time when you come back and tell us more about how do I think about my own retirement or what do I need to know about my own parents and getting them care if, when it comes to that. So I think that's also an interesting perspective on joy and how do we find joy in that? So if you'll come back, I would love to have that discussion. I will. And I, we should have Deanna come back to with me on that one, because I, I will tell you, there is joy in aging. And there is joy in relationships and there's joy in caregiving. And, but the joy comes because you plan for it. Not, you don't plan for the actual emotion of joy, but you plan for and prepare for and understand what, because so many people are in denial of, I'm like, yeah, I'm 48. I'm all, I'll be 49 in February next year. I'm cool. I'm like, don't have a problem telling what my age is because like, I feel like it's a gift and it's an honor. Now there's some crappy things that may come with it as, each year ticks up. But if I understand what's available to me, or both my parents are, you know, in their mid seventies now, and, you know, as things go for them, if things change, I have to understand what is my role. And, but more importantly, what is it that they want? And then when I learn that, then I, you know, so we can create joy in the process of aging it. And it can be very traumatic. It can be very sad and emotional, but when you kind of take control of, what is in front of you, there's joy in that. And no one can predict what's going to happen tomorrow, but there is joy in that. Yeah, for sure. That ties really closely into, sometimes I talk even about from a project management standpoint, it's like well-planned, but loosely held. Like we kind of have a direction we're heading and we understand it, but then we also, like you're saying, we evolve. We, we allow for the other things to come in so that we can react to them, but also remain in that like, okay, this is the planning. This isn't just us reacting and getting emotional. I had a client who brought us on board and she hired us. Her husband was diagnosed with cancer and it was a very, very aggressive cancer. Basically the, the opportunity for him to survive was they, they were going to go through some experimental treatment, but it, it, we saw the rapid decline coming and she called and said, you know, look, I don't know what I need, but I need a project manager. I need someone. I, I do everything by a project manager. So she said, I need to be able to ask questions and I need you to help me be the project manager to make these things happen and we'll go from there. So that's what, um, it's, so the project manager, it's a good way to put it. Yeah. I mean, and that's my background. I mean, and so it's interesting to kind of layer in how can we be like more analytical and less heart involved? I mean, if you can pull those pieces of your own self out of a situation, I think that's it is good to have somebody who can guide you through that process. If it's something where you know I'm going to be really emotionally involved with this loved one and their 
they're aging, well, how can I find an, an objective outsider to help me see the things for what they are instead of it being scary or upsetting or all that? Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the pragmatic and the emotional. And there is joy when you figure out what the balance is, but you have to plan in advance. It can't just be in the moment. And it's a little bit of planning that comes in with it. And sometimes the planning can be a lot of fun. It just depends how you approach it. We make it fun. (laughs) I'm sure that you do. Well, if somebody wants to find out more about you and Deanna and how they might work with you, would you let us know where your website is and how they can find you? Absolutely. So our website is LegacyConciergeServices.com. And within the website um, on the top right corner, there's a little icon where you can actually click to set up an appointment for a free 30 minute consultation. So that is just to see if is there opportunity for us to start planning or start doing whatever needs to be done. And then also, is it a good fit? Are we a good fit for the family? And is the family a good fit for us? So it's an opportunity just to start the conversation and to keep it safe and confidential. But also we have a pretty active Facebook page too, which is just Legacy Concierge Services. And we have a newsletter also people can sign up for, but we try to be as accessible as possible. It is just me and Deanna. So we're very reachable, very transparent in everything we do. And So when you call, it's going to be either me or her that answered the phone and we will help you. And uh, if we can't help you, we will find someone who will. And that's really important to us. So thank you. And I'll leave it to those in the show notes if people are driving and they want to click through later. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And your book, if somebody wants to dive into that, where can they find it? It can be found on Amazon. It's called Awakening and Deepening to Truth. My edition is the fourth edition. And you can find it on Amazon or you can shoot me a, an email through our uh, Legacy Concierge Services website and um, you can buy it through me. I, ha- I may have some extra copies laying around. Well, and then I have one last question that I ask everybody and it is last and most joyfully, what are three ways that you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world or in other people's lives? Oh gosh, I love that. Okay. One is the first one I think is so important is to listen. I think to listen and allow people to share and listen authentically. I should add that. I think that's important. Um, Number two is to laugh, find opportunity to laugh. And I think number three too is be humble. And I think when you're humble, that allows other people to share who they are. And there's great joy in seeing other people's happiness. So my dog agrees. <laughs> Thank you. I love those. And it's funny <laughs> in six years, no one said be humble. Really? Yeah. I love oh, it. Wow. Yeah. That just, that's what I think, because I think that's joy. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Molly. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. You're amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show, Molly. It's been such a treat to have you here. If you want to find out more about her or where to find her legacy concierge services, you can find all of the links over at my website at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash episode 270. And while you're there, you can also find the link to her book. And I hope you'll go check her out and tell her that you heard about her here on Jumpstart Your Joy. Also, while you're on the website, be sure and sign up for the weekly newsletter, which is, of course, all about three joyful things. And it comes out every Thursday. You can find that link right there on the homepage. If somewhere along the way you've had an aha moment and seen joy in the messy middle in a little bit of a different way through these episodes, I would also love to hear from you. You can email me at jumpstartyourjoy at gmail.com. Or you could follow me on Instagram at jumpstartyourjoy and comment on any of the photos there. I would love to hear from you. Next week on the show, I'm really delighted to be doing a solo cast. uh, And we'll be talking a little bit about how to find joy right now and what you can do, even though we're seemingly in an even more messier place (laughs) than we had been recently before the election started. So I'll be giving you some of the things that have been shifting in my own life and a few easy ideas on how you can make space for a little bit more joy, even when we're in the middle of not really being sure what's going on. (laughs) And maybe it's hard to find your grounding right now, because I'm surely feeling that as well. So I hope you'll come back next week for that episode. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.